that could not be consumed by people or animals. And I rang up, when I wrote to the Labour Party, and they replied that they had issued a memorandum in 2010 and many more rules and control should be made with regard to oil and mineral extraction. They do not seem to progress any further, but it was actually very interesting in the newspaper uh, on Saturday. It was a very good article on Saturday the 8th uh, of October, if anybody's wanting to get into it. It's an excellent uh, oil drilling article by press reporter Vicky Anderson. And she quoted the Green Party co-leader, Metateria Turia, and she was told by government ministers that if there was a blowout at either of the deep water exploratory wells, Andarco would not be required to post a bond. And the Labour mm. Party said the current situation is absolutely scandalous. There are no environmental conditions attached to any of the exploration permits currently granted by the national government. They're just dishing them out with no liabilities at all. And um, Labour's not exposed to it. Ex- Exploration, but they said they would like to look to adopt the Norwegian approach. And in Norway, apparently, there is strict independent safety enforcement, wide community consultation before exploration begins, openness about such activity, and a royalties regime that benefits the local people and better respect for private property rights. And the um, Green Party, uh, I mean, that they, um, they they're really taking it up as an election issue. They've they've um, they're very, very keen on protecting the clean water. That's always been their po- policy anyway. And they, they, they're they wanting more investigations into the risks of, of what mineral fracking could do and to make people more aware of what's actually going on. Well, how interesting that, you know, basically all, all our governments, Labour, National, Labour aren't going to stop it, obviously. They're going for the softer approach. Uh, the Green Party, interesting that they're even interested in this, is they've turned an absolute blind eye to the chemtrail issue, the geoengineering of our skies. And, you know, if they wanted to actually look at that issue, this, this is directly related to what, what this exploration out there. So, you know, I just... I have no time for any of these politicians and, you know, as much as the Greens are out there perhaps exposing it a little bit, I'm not holding my breath with the future of our country. Now, I've heard uh, at the moment, Penny, that the rebuild of Christchurch is not happening due to insurance companies refusing to front up with reinsurance um, with, you know, so many ongoing quakes. If that's the case, how does a company like Andaco get insurance to cover its losses to the fishing and tourism industry in the event of a large spill? Well, I actually wrote to Nick Smith, who's the National Party Minister for the Environment. Um, I I wrote to him about this um, lack of insurance, and and they said they'd get back to me. But he told me that I did not need to worry about fracking, as this method has been used for some time with Taranaki oil extraction, and local quakes were not connected to this. Now, I don't live near Taranaki, but I've since discovered the government is totally ignoring a very vocal Taranaki group who claim fracking is badly affecting their community, and there's no insurance policies there to actually um, help them with the, actually with the, with the issue. And, I mean, it's the same situation with Andarco. I mean, who's going to pay if we have the Deepwater Horizon? Greenpeace say we don't actually have the facilities to, to, plug, to plug a oil leak like Deepwater Horizon, which required 600 ships to actually stop the oil leaking. And I, I think it's probably still seeping out. I don't know. You are listening to Revolution Radio. We are 100% listener supported. We have archives, lots of information on the site. You can join us at www.freedomslips.com. There is an online radio on there that you can listen to the show. There's an awesome group in chat. You can either go through it as java or flash you can also visit some of us at www.thecontrail.com and please feel free to make any donation if you could it would be like a simple cup of coffee with your morning paper and again thanks for listening you should with us the um extraordinary experiences and and near your farmland, which showed without any doubt a long-term radio and microwave exposure affecting people, animals, plants and wildlife. All over the world, independent scientists are lobbying for lower and safer exposure limits. Many of our listeners are grateful to you, Penny, for introducing them to websites to help them understand this issue more. Well, well, I hope it does help because I can remember when um, we first found out about it, I mean, they were just busy saying there's no problem, it's quite safe and 
And at that stage, I probably accepted what the government said. But then when you start to get into it, you just find that there's a huge big can of worms. And particularly um, with the uh, electromagnetic radiation with the communication industry, I spoke to you the other day about the website by UK physicist Dr. Trow, and mm. he's actually presented the information to the British Parliament um, at the request of the United Kingdom policemen uh, who have got very sick from the police frequency called Tetra. Now, this week um, I've just received a, a really amazing YouTube series on Dr. Trow's work, and it's he, he says it in a, in a very easy manner for people to understand what it's all about. And mm. he's an old man now, but his whole life seems to be focused on helping people with electromagnetic radiation problems. And he actually travels the world giving his expertise for free in high court cases where he's challenging the safety and the, the risk of the unsafe standard of the ICNIC exposure, which is actually the one that New Zealand and the US have adopted Mm. He says that although more than 8,000 research papers show the standard is not safe, industry says it is safe, and the reason why they say it is safe is because they make trillions trillions out of this technology, Mm. and they can pay researchers to do studies which show no harm, and anybody who's a whistleblower like me has dealt with in many ways, including 24-hour surveillance, funding removed to shut down their research, bank mortgages refused, which is what's happening to me, and they tried to discredit them publicly, as happened to a very interesting woman called Professor Havis recently. And if you actually look up, and if the whistleblowers become too troublesome, in some cases they just die unusually quickly. And there's some very good websites for these amazing people who are risking their lives and their financial situations to actually help people like us understand what's going on. Yes, uh, our whistleblowers certainly do put their necks on the line, Penny, mm-hmm. and um, you are one of those people here in New Zealand. Now, I, I saw two articles this week which show that in Canada and San Francisco, the authorities are finally cracking, well, are finally acknowledging harm might be caused from cell phones and are requesting by law warnings to be placed on these phones. Why do you think this is suddenly happening when Dr. Trower claims that more than 20 years of industry and governments have been aware of this research showing him? Well, it's, it is a new acknowledgement that, um, and it seems to be a breakthrough for people, you know, to actually, instead of them saying it's safe, it's just warning people of potential harm, especially for young children using cell phones. I've got a very large copy of the Royal Canadian Research, um, which was, oh, well, they do it every year, they renew it all. And for many years, they failed to warn people of the potential harm, even though this report claims more research must be taken, undertaken, especially in relation to harm to eyes. And I spoke about that previously last, last time I was talked to in relation to the use of wire rim glasses amplifying mm. the radiation into the moisture of your eyes. Mm. And your eyes are particularly vulnerable because they're in a reflective bony cave. But the interesting thing is the telecommunication industry response to the demands for warnings is they're preparing to take the San Francisco municipality to court. And you sort of think, well, really, that's, well, from their point of view, they obviously think they're going to stop them putting the warning signs up. But what all they're actually going to do is publicize that there, that there are problems. And it's quite interesting. Do, do you have any theories about the reason why sudden acceptance that warnings must be posted on cell phones? Are... You mean after uh, such a long time that nothing's after, been done? Uh, yeah. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Well, the recent reports in the World Health Organization have actually accepted that there is some potential risk for cancer from cell phones, but the research they've quoted is actually not very new research. So you wonder why the World Health Organization is suddenly actually acknowledging the potential harm. Um, In the past, I've received a few emails related to insurance fears and um, that the long-term effects from cell phone use is going to be far worse than the huge claims made in relation to the tobacco industry. So I think that... um, these um, areas are actually getting a bit scared that um, because the cell phone industry has been using spin doctors to try and smother the truth, that people involved in in insurance, like Lloyd's Insurance, that I actually know that they're very worried. And I think that if the places like, if, if the governments and big city councils don't actually give out the warnings, they could be the ones who'd be forced to accept the future liabilities themselves. And I think it's really just to cover themselves. You know, we've warned you, now it's up to you to make your decision whether you use the cell phones or you go and sit by your Wi-Fi and what you do. But the trouble is if you're a group of people trying to stop Wi-Fi, smart meters, 
um, self antasne, you the councils will just say, Oh well I'm sorry we can't help you, it's all within the new le- you know, within the legal standards. So it's a little bit of a I don't know what sort of situation you call it, but they're giving the warnings but they're not doing anything about stopping the problem. You've uh, referred to independent scientists claims that the galloping use of technology is already creating a worldwide breakdown in health and will affect the world's economy, Penny. Well, they're actually saying that it's it's just like, well, it's a little bit like a tidal wave, that, that the effects on people who have been using cell phones for a long time, it seems to be quite a long time before people who use cell phones actually get their brain tumours. And there's a, there's a couple of really good um, articles that have just come out recently. Well, UK researcher Dr Goldsworthy in the 2011 New Zealand documentary, Our Cell Phones Killing You?, uh, claimed that, that it was just like the tip of the iceberg about to collapse. Mm. And um, another one that's actually come out, which I've, I found very interesting, is is a YouTube called Disconnect, which has been put out by somebody who's been doing, I think he's worked in the, he's been working in the um, communication industry, I think in the cell phone industry, and he's um, been very badly affected. So uh, we'll put we'll put the uh, links for Dr. Goldsworthy's um, documentary, Are Cell Phones Killing You?, uh, and the in the chat. Mm. Mm. Do you feel that any one technology is worse than the other? We're watching smart meters being rolled out fast and Wi-Fi and schools are causing massive uh, anti-campaigns worldwide. Are these worse than radio waves? Well, it's all, I think the researchers are all actually saying it's the combinations of frequencies. Dr. Trow in his YouTube presentation, which I just cannot recommend more highly, claims that microwave frequency is more harmful as it will go through anything, including human bodies, whereas mm. radio wave technology can be reflected, um, it, 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 well, can be reflected and affect you more, well, microwaves can as well, because they reflect off. If you're in a car and you're using your cell phone, you're actually getting a resonance in the car from the frequency um, resonating against the metal. Um, mm. And he says the radio technology can curve around obstructions. I have read that some frequencies are much more incompatible with the human body than others. Uh, from my own reactions, I've personally noticed that different frequencies affect different parts of my body. And the AM is especially harmful to my blood and gives me terrible bone pain. And the FM frequency exposure, it seems to affect electrical systems it makes me absolutely woolly in the brain. I just get like I'm a zombie and it makes my heart palpitate and awful pains in my chest. And then when I'm away from the FM, I don't get that problem at all. Um, microwave is probably the worst effect of all at my farm, but it's really difficult to know which is the worst because when you've got the combinations of all of them, um, they're doing exactly what happens when, you, when you're in a room where you've got a lot of um, electronic t- uh, equipment operating they all collide and oscillate with each other and, and um, cause basically electro smog. So it's really difficult to tell which is the worst. Um, Dr. Becker, who was awarded this prestigious award, this is the US doctor, amazing man, and he used the frequencies to uh, quicken up fracture healing, but found some frequencies caused the bone to disintegrate. And when he later published his work, they had his funding removed because they didn't like him saying that about the fre- some frequencies being damaging. I bet. Um, last week I recommended his book, and Cross Current is one of them. Um, I can remember when I read this first that I was amazed when he claimed that 50 and 60 hertz, which are used from power line frequencies, are incompatible with the human body, whereas if 55 hertz had been used, the harm from the pylons would be minimized. So you, you just wonder why they don't use the frequency that doesn't affect the body so much. Yes, indeed. I mean, why does the electrical industry not use that frequency? I don't know why. I'd have to actually ask an expert. Um, I'm actually seeing a professor in electrical engineering this afternoon, so I'll actually ask him because it'd be interesting to know. I've noticed more people seem to get sick under pylons who live where there's another frequency such as cell cell tower nearby. And Dr. AD, US Dr. AD, he he said his research that when you have multiple interacting frequencies, that's when the harm occurs. Mm. And I know in New Zealand, of up in an area called Massey, um, several young men, very, very fit young sportsmen, um, died of cancer. And the TV program about them showed the National Radiation Laboratory was monitoring under the power lines. And they said the exposure levels were very low and couldn't have made the children sick or the teenagers sick. But they were failing to monitor the AEM emissions from the nearby tower, which um, you could see it in the background. And this would have interacted with the power line 
frequency. Yes, right. And um, an electrical engineer has been helping me. It's called Dr. Kurdamalaitis, and he says each technology multiplies the effect. Mm. 